Have you ever wondered what the most common problems for Chevy Trailblazer vehicles are? Well, you come to the right place. This is the Car Doctor Channel. All right, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, thanks for stopping by. Please subscribe, we've got other cool vids for you. My name's Tim, I'm here in Anchorage, Alaska at the repair shop of Donor Automotive. And uh, today we got another just continuing uh, in the common problems video series. And we have a Chevy Trailblazer. We're talking about common issues with those. Chevy Trailblazer, kind of the uh, continuing line of Chevy Blazers. Uh, in 2002, GM came out with the first Chevy Trailblazer. And uh, that was first generation. 2012 through present is the second generation of Trailblazer vehicles. Uh, they came equipped with either a 4.2, a 5.3, some models, the SS, came with a, a 6.0 motor. Uh, also, the Chevy Trailblazer EXT is an adaptation of that. They came in either two or four-wheel drive. And uh, this one here is an O2, the four-wheel drive model. It's got the 4.2 motor. And a lot of similarities across the models and years. And I'm just going to pick apart the most common issues. So let's plow right into it. The number one issue with Chevy Trailblazers uh, has been a illuminated check engine light and subsequent code P0014. Problems with the variable valve timing solenoid, uh, variable valve timing, variable valve timing system adjusts cam timing based on certain parameters and uh, the problem that uh, occurs is sometimes related to the variable valve timing solenoid, the variable valve timing solenoid uh, screens which uh, screen the oil that's running through the variable valve timing solenoid. Uh, the screens can fall out, uh, they can become clogged, uh, people don't properly maintain their vehicles so uh, oil can become contaminated and whatnot and cause this issue. So on the 4.2 motor, the variable valve timing solenoid is located on the right front side of the cylinder head and has a, a small connector, a wiring connector connecting to it. And it's just uh, retained by a, a little 10 millimeter bolt head uh, bolt in there. Uh, very common problem. A problem with the system may present a code P0014, a P0017, or you may also get a P1345. Uh, all these are going to point you back towards the variable valve timing uh, solenoid. You want to check, pull that out, check the screens, see if they're restricted, see if the screen's missing. Um, also, a uh, possible cause is a uh, crankshaft can be uh, become a little bit loose and have excessive in play. That can cause an issue too. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that I have a video on this exact problem. I'll, I'll look through and I'm going to post a bunch of video links in the description of this video. Uh, I just can't recall if I've done one on this before, but uh, odds are it's probably the, uh, the uh, solenoid causing the problem. Uh, also low oil or improperly maintained oil. Uh, worst case scenario, you've got a engine problem, uh, which would be a bummer deal, but it sure doesn't take much to replace the uh, solenoid and uh, check and see if that condition clears up. Uh, you also want to do a crank variation relearn whenever that solenoid's replaced just to uh, sync up the cam and crank correlation there. Second most common problem, P0440. P0440 indicates leakage uh, in the fuel evaporative system and the most likely cause, your bad gas cap. Uh, bad gas cap can cause leakage, leakage around the seal. Uh, these gas caps don't seal that well anyway. When they wear and get tired, they, they kind of seem like they get tight, but then they just fall loose anyway. Uh, a bad gas cap can cause that leakage around the fill pipe, leakage anywhere in the EVAP system. Uh, and then uh, another common problem is a faulty uh, vent valve, the vent valve down by the canister. Can clog up, get a little dirt in it, not seal properly, and it won't pass the uh, leak test on the EVAP system. Third most common problem with the Chevy Trailblazer is going to be, an, again, a, an illuminated check engine light and a stored code PO3. Uh, 
340 indicates a problem with the CAM position sensor circuit and most likely will be the CAM position sensor which is actually mounted here in the front face of the cylinder head. Super easy to get to, another easy sensor to replace, inexpensive, I always go with AC Delco parts. Uh, there's some other possibilities and again this is one where you want to do the crank variation relearn anytime you service one of those. Uh, pretty straightforward deal there. Alright, fourth most common problem with the Chevy Trailblazer. For the four wheel drive equipped vehicles you're going to see a message. It says service four wheel drive system. You're going to be like, oh crap, what now? Anyway, you go to a shop, they pull the codes for the transfer case, or maybe you have a code reader yourself that can access T-Case module. It's going to give you a code CO550. You're going to be like, crud, what now? It's probably a bad transfer case control module. Uh, if you do replace the TCCM, uh, you may need to reprogram that uh, and, and definitely go through a relearn procedure. Uh, consult your manufacturer's uh, recommended service manual for that. All right, we're back under the hood for number five, common problem, a misfire issue. You're driving down the road, it starts bucking. You're under a load, you're going up a hill, you're towing a trailer, maybe you're towing a 50-foot fifth wheel. Probably not, but anyway, you've got a misfire issue. Usually check engine lights illuminated, maybe even flashing. You may pull a code P0300, P0301. This applies to both the, the V8 and the six-cylinder models. Uh, anyway, typical problems, ignition coils on the 4.2 uh, motor, ignition coils all the time. Get over 100,000 miles, maybe even less, you're going to start having bad coils. Only put your GM part in there, guys. And you want to tune these up, around 100,000, uh, especially if you start getting misfire issues. Replace the, at least the coil boots and the, and the spark plugs with AC Delco parts. Uh, or if you, money's no object, throw all six coils in there while you're at it. Uh, it does require removing this, uh, this upper intake deal here. It's, it's pretty easy, but you gotta make sure and get it back on right. You will, uh, if you don't get this hose, vent hose in the front hooked up properly, it's gonna come back with like a PO 171, 174 uh, problem, and you're gonna think it's got a bad mass airflow or something. Uh, no, it's just an improperly connected hose. We see it all the time. Uh, so watch your hose is getting reconnected when you're in there. Make sure you don't uh, cross-thread the bolts that retain the coils. Another super big common problem. Uh, another problem is going to be your fuel injectors. Uh, I would say almost as common as the coils, we're getting fuel injector issues, especially in areas where fuel supply may be questionable. Maybe you get kind of sub-quality par gas or you've uh, introduced gas out of a plastic can. That's a big no-no. And uh, these cars are very susceptible to injector problems. So uh, if a misfire condition exists, uh, it's good to check the injectors as well as the ignition side to determine what that actual problem is. All right, here's a big one. We see it all the time. A water pump. The water pump's leaking. Uh, the water pump shaft's got play. You're starting to have belt noise. There's problems. You go up here and you're like, okay, replace a water pump. That ought to be easy. It ain't. I don't know who designed this. This is not, I'm a Chevy guy, man. Don't, you know, beat the messenger with, with your uh, owner's manual. I'm, I, I like Chevys. I just don't know how they call this a Chevy. Who did this? Why would you make one like that? Anyway, I do have a video with some helpful tips that are going to cut the uh, labor time about in half or more on water pump or fan clutch replacement, a very common issue with this vehicle. Uh, it's going to help you save a ton of time, only take you a couple hours if you follow my proven tips for replacing that. Uh, another issue with the electromagnetic, clu uh, electromagnetic clutches on these fan clutches they can actually short and then it, it shares a circuit with, with a, a voltage reference cir circuit uh, that measures actually it's part of the fan speed portion of the electromagnetic fan clutch and that's a shared circuit with like your crank sensor and whatnot. Talk about issues man, your, your car is going to stall, check engine light's going to come on, 
you're going to have all sorts of weird crank sensor codes and, and strange voltage reference issues. Um, that's a possible problem right there. So uh, if that's the case, you're just going to start unplugging things like the fan and the crank sensor and uh, try to figure out where that, uh, that draw or, or you know, drain that's pulling that voltage reference down is located. And along those lines, the uh, 5.3 and 6.0 motors having uh, the same type of problems with when it's actually the crank sensor that shorted. I've got another video on that, a time-saving tip for getting that crank sensor out. It's uh, not an easy deal, but if you follow my video, it's going to save you hours and hours of time over the book time and process for doing that. Okay, so here's an issue. You're driving down the road, it's winter time. Your car never gets warm. Your, your coolant temp reading is always below 150 and just never climbs above. You get a little bit of warm air, you're scraping the window inside going, I'm done with this. Well, it's probably a bad thermostat. Thermostat, super common problem, especially with these 4.2 motors for whatever reason. And uh, there is a way to get to it. Pull this left front tire off over here and go up through the fender well. There's two bolts on the stat housing cover. Again, this is one of those things where it's real tight up in there. Um, and you don't want to cross thread those bolts going back in, but uh, it's not too bad of a fix if, you, if you're able to lift the vehicle and get that left front tire off to access the thermostat. All right, you're driving down the road and you get this message, service airbag. You're like, is this thing gonna blow up in my face or is it not gonna blow up when it's supposed to blow up or am I gonna blow up and go up in flames? Well, no, but it's probably unsafe, and the reason why is your airbag clock spring is probably bad. So, if you get a uh, airbag message, and uh, you pull the codes, and you got a BO026 or BO044, or maybe 43 or BO024, uh, it's all related to the uh, driver front airbag deployment and voltage uh, circuits, not. Uh, not giving proper uh, reading back to the airbag module. There's a list of the common codes for this issue. It's usually a bad airbag clock spring, which is the coil of wires that sit underneath the steering wheel and connect the airbag to the actual wiring in the module. Um, here's a quick tip for uh, diagnosing these. You go down to uh, uh, Radio Shack and get a little 2 ohm resistor. And then you go under and there's the uh, airbag uh, connector under the steering column. Disconnect that and on the module side of the wiring, place your 2 ohm resistor. Then you turn on the key and you know let the airbag light flash. If it goes out and you no longer have a message or an illuminated airbag light, then you know the problem's up here. Uh, then you, you go ahead and turn off the vehicle, remove the, the airbag, uh, always follow the manufacturer's recommended procedure for doing this, of course, very uh, dangerous repair if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but anyway, uh, remove, remove that and then go put that coil uh, in place of the airbag, uh, uh, the resistor in place of the airbag on the connector and turn it back on. So if the light flashes and goes out uh, and, and everything looks good, then, then it's a bad airbag module, which is very uncommon. Uh, if it continues to flash, then uh, it's likely the airbag clock spring or, or uh, supplemental impact restraint inflator coil that needs to be changed. And you just have to uh, pull the airbag, uh, pop the steering wheel off, and replace the coil underneath there. Okay, you're gonna have to give me just one last rant here, okay? And then we'll be, we'll be done. Uh, my last big problem with this vehicle is the front differential. You know, you got a four-wheel drive vehicle and you're so happy because it's winter time and it's icy and you're cruising along and it feels so good. And then all of a sudden you got a service four-wheel drive message or you got a clunky noise uh, in, when you're engaged in four-wheel drive or the four-wheel drive is just, it's just not working and uh, you're wondering what's going on, so you take it to a shop or you crawl underneath and you go through a process of, uh, of allevi alleviating some possibilities 
and you come to the conclusion that the differential actuator assembly, which is basically what bolts to the, to the passenger side of the oil pan, which is basically the right side of the differential that passes through the oil pan. That's another good idea. Hey, let's build a car where the front differential goes through the oil pan. Yeah, good idea. So anyway, they go bad. They're junk. You can't even find them anymore. They don't even have them. You have to go get a used one if you can and put it in here. You can't even fix them. And nobody wants to. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a bummer deal. This poor guy, he, he had his differential rebuilt. And two days later, his uh, actuator went bad. I didn't do this work. Came from another shop, but uh, it was a bummer deal. The guy ended up putting a used actuator in and, and kind of gave him a break. But the whole thing ended up being like 3,500 bucks. And uh, I don't even like doing them. You'll get oil leaks generated uh, the, uh, along the oil pan where they pass through. You'll get uh, problems with the uh, side gears coming loose and the differential carrier coming apart. All sorts of metal in there, terrible noises. Um, you'll get those actuator problems. The actuator case will just break in half. And uh, bad things happen. So poor design, um, not a good idea. Okay, just uh, steering and suspension, uh, pretty run of the mill. Um, they do have uh, some problems with the front hub and bearing assemblies. That'll usually get you through, you know, 100,000 miles plus uh, upper and lower ball joints. You know, once you get to 150,000 miles, you're going to probably need to go through your suspension. And the brakes are, they're about average for a Chevy, I would say. No major abnormal problems with that. The rack and pinion seem to hold up pretty good in these. Uh, transfer cases, uh, of course this one's leaking a bit, but uh, yeah, they seem to hold up pretty good. Once in a while you get these T-case motors here, go out, U-joints, uh, this, this is a factory shaft and U-joints on this, and obviously uh, still doing okay. Uh, rear differential, uh, you know, leaky seals, you can see this one's leaking a bit. This is a higher mileage vehicle, um, but nothing serious. Uh, exhaust system's very solid on this truck. Uh, Seem to work pretty good. Uh, th those guys replacing this this uh, front differential, they must have not tightened down the the U joint saddle bolts there. We'll get that squared away. Not a big deal. So, rest of it's pretty pretty much average, I would say. Well, thanks for letting me rant a little bit there. I uh, just had to get that out, you know. Uh, you know, hey, uh, I, I, I'm a Chevy guy, and these vehicles, they really fit a, kind of a niche uh, that uh, really no other vehicles do, or, you know, maybe along the lines of Ford Escape, which I, I don't know that I have any higher opinion of those. Uh, so uh, they definitely have their useful niche to fill, and... Uh, you know, we certainly see them a lot here, so uh, we, we like to work on them for the most part. Uh, but anyway, hopefully that'll help a little bit if you're in the market for uh, a used one. You might know what to look for. Uh, I would definitely look for a lower mileage vehicle if you, if you, if you get away from the, the 4.2 motor. The 5.3 might be a good option um, in a two-wheel drive probably a lot less issues that you'll encounter. You want to make sure they've been serviced, maintained well, and uh, with, as with any vehicle, get a, get a trained set of eyes on that thing to, uh, you know, that we know what we're looking for, so we'll help you identify, you know, if you've got a regular mechanic, take it by them, because they're the ones that are your advocate and they're gonna watch out for you, and they're the ones that are gonna have to work on this thing for the next 10 years or whatever, so they want to be, uh, communicating everything that you need to know about that purchase that you're going to make. Uh, anyway, I do appreciate you uh, checking out the video. Thanks for stopping by the Car Doctor channel, and I will catch you next time. Have a good one.